Welcome to Daybreak Asia. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. Australia has just come online. The top stories is our Asian stocks are set to end the week on a high note after a tech fueled rally on Wall Street. The Nasdaq 100 closing at a record high and TSMC's positive outlook lifting chip makers. Oil is rising alongside equities as tensions shimmer in the red simmer in the Red Sea and the US stock piles falling to the lowest since October. And we'll be delving deeper into geopolitical tensions in the Middle East and Asia when we speak live with the U.S. Ambassador to Japan, Rahm Emanuel. But first, let's take you straight to the setup uh, across Asia and going into the side of trading here in Sydney. Looking like we'll finally snap that five sessions of uh, consecutive losses that we've seen for the ASX. A little bit of upside there as we get into the side of trading. We are expecting uh, really that tailwind to carry through from what was a pretty big Wall Street session, particularly when it comes to tech. Watching for some of those Apple suppliers here in Asia as well, given that Apple climbed on the back of that analyst upgrade. And as I just mentioned, it could be a higher day when it comes to chip makers as well. Uh, some of these other big tech names with uh, Taiwan Semi's outlook boosting that sector. This is the picture as we get into the staggered open, about just uh, two tenths of one percent higher here. We're trading at lows of uh, about the first week of December at this point for Australian stocks. The Aussie dollar also holding pretty steady at 65.75. The other half of the equation, of course, is really where the Fed goes from here. Some of that uh, more robust labour market data kind of, uh, again, adding to a little bit more colour to the narrative of when, where, how these rate cuts come through, Sherry. Yeah, take a look at how US futures are coming online in the Asian session. Really not a lot of movement at the moment, but of course this after the S&P 500 managed to gain ground for the first time in three sessions. We had an analyst upgrade for Apple, not to mention the chip makers got a boost uh, given TSMC's more positive outlook but the Treasury's market looked a little bit mixed because of that resilient labor data that you mentioned Heidi with jobless claims falling to the lowest level since 2022 we're also watching oil prices right now in the Asian session coming under a little bit of pressure but it's really to do with what's happening in the Middle East not to mention that US stockpiles of course took a hit we do have a cold front production is getting hit a little bit and of course this will really have implications for the broader inflationary outlook we have Fed speak today more with Rafael Bostic, the Atlanta Fed president, coming out and see, saying that he wants to see more evidence that we're headed towards a 2% inflation target. And we had, of course, plenty of guests at Davos speaking to Bloomberg and talking about where they expect the Fed to go from here. Take a listen. It seems we don't have that actually, that sound. But basically, the question right now, Heidi, about where markets go from here, where economies go from here, is really to do with what's happening with the Fed and what we can expect. Will it be six rate cuts, seven rate cuts? I mean, a lot of people saying that perhaps the markets are getting ahead of themselves. Yeah, we could hear from voices at Davos. We could just hear from our very own chief rates correspondent for Asia. I'm live contributor Garth Rude Reynolds. He's here in Sydney. Uh, Garth, this is, this is, you know, the, 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 the eternal debate, at least for this year. Oh yeah, this is what's going to be driving. It's what drove market. Well, what drove markets last year was when do they stop hiking rates. What's driving them this year is when do they start. And uh, yeah, there was a fair bit of head scratching you know, over the last few weeks about just how strong the bets were on a March rate cut from the Fed, when the data weren't you know, really backing that up and the rhetoric wasn't backing that up. And uh, it seems like there was some expectation that uh, Governor Waller, when he spoke this week, might you know, underscore his uh, avowed, you know, his, his previous comments that he could see a path to, to rate cuts. But instead, he, he, he pushed back and in particular you know, said he couldn't see the case for cutting rates as rapidly as they had done you know, in the past. So that's caused a pretty rapid unwind in those bets for a March cut and some reduction in the expectations for, I think we're now looking at five and a bit instead of six and a half cuts priced in for the year. But the market still remains very firmly of the opinion that they will be cutting now that you know, the rate cut is fully priced in for May. So the question is going to be, how do the data go from here? How does the rhetoric go from year here? Do we get a rerun of the, no, it's not in March, it's later, when we move, if, you know, if we don't get a cut in March, do we then move to, okay, is it going to be May or is it not going to be till the second half of this year?
Garfield is also the expectation of where bond yields could go from here factoring into the tech play right now is it really purely to do with that optimism about AI of course we saw chip makers really rallying and sending the NASA 100 to a record high again well, there's that optimism about AI. There's also, you know, even after we've had a bad week for bonds, uh, yields are still significantly lower than they got, you know, at the, at the, at the heights last year. And, you know, by hook or by crook, uh, tech has been the place to get strong returns, whether that's been AI, whether it's just, yeah, I mean, Apple is rebounding after a little bit of weakness. Apple's less of an AI. AI play than just a you know general tech play. Netflix has been doing all right as well. All of those, you know, the Magnificent Seven, they're seen by investors as being the place to go to get high returns with not a huge amount of risk. Uh, you know, rightly or wrongly, that's been the perception that's been fostered by, you know, in the post-pandemic era, they've gone up most of the time. When they did come crashing down, along with everything else in 2022, they pretty rapidly, you know, came roaring back up and they're one of the few asset classes to be, you know, back at a fresh record. So investors have faith in them unless we get a serious bond sell-off or we get something that disrupts you know the idea that through a combination of AI and their you know, strong grasp on cons on the consumer you know that that strong demand that keeps on coming through for the high-tech companies offerings unless something disrupts that you, you can see them you know, continuing to attract money in all but the you know the, the worst couple of, of days you know that, that might strike in the next few weeks. Bloomberg's Chief Rates Correspondent for Asia and MLive contributor Garfield Reynolds here in Sydney. We're also watching oil markets as we see prices continuing to just ratchet higher. Some of that pressure, of course, coming from the geopolitical situation. And President Biden saying strikes against the Iran-backed Houthi militants in Yemen will continue even if they have not halted the group's attacks in the Red Sea. Bloomberg's Michael Heath joins us now. So he's acknowledging the kind of limited impact. Uh, and we've seen the Houthis responding, saying that they'll just improve their own military might. What options? remain. Well, I guess, I mean, what he's saying is they're just going to have to keep going, aren't they, Heidi? And um, and it's a it's a, a gamble that the US is, and, and the UK have taken. The UK is involved here as well, uh, because initially the Houthis were just targeting ships that were, were related to Israel. So it was sort of um, once 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 in a while they'd, they'd strike. Now, uh, because the US and UK are involved, they're, they're widening the, 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 the targets that they say that they'll go after uh, to any shipping that's related to, to those two nations. So we're seeing that uh, it's happening pretty regularly. Any ships that go through there that have any connection to, to either of those three countries um, are, are being um, attacked, whether it's by drones, whether it's by missiles. And, and you're right, the, the Houthis do seem to have a, a very deep supply of, <coughs> excuse me, of weapons. Um, the US obviously inter uh, inter interdicted some uh, Iran an Iranian shipment that went there as well. So um, it looks like this is going to persist for a while longer here. I mean, about 12% of trade goes through there. We, there's talk now that, you know, does this start to interrupt supply lines? Does it play into inflation? It's probably too early to talk about that. But um, the president himself has sort of acknowledged that, that they're not making much of a difference at this stage. So we'll just have to see how it plays out. At least when it comes to the future of the Middle East, Israel seems to be insisting on security control over the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. That's not really sitting well with Washington. No, it's not, Sherry. And I mean, you, you have to sort of uh, feel sorry for President Biden when he opens up his foreign policy brief each morning. It can't be good reading. I mean, it's just uh, <laughs> problems from one end of the world to the other, really. Um, you look at it, you've got Israel and, and, uh, and Hamas in Gaza. Uh, you've got uh, potentially Israel and Lebanon. You've got Iran um, striking at uh, what it says is an Israeli base in Iraq. You've got um, nuclear armed Pakistan and, and nuclear threshold Iran firing missiles at each other as well. I mean, I mean, it's really, really quite an quite a unstable position we're in at the moment as well. Uh, but yes, I mean, Israel, in, in terms of, of that position with, um, with Gaza, it's not really a surprise that they say that they're going to, to need to control the, um, control the security situation with the Gaza Strip. And, um, and I, su I suppose President Biden would be disappointed, but it, but it wouldn't surprise him in a way. I mean, Pre uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has been creating trouble for Democratic presidents basically since Bill Clinton's time. Um, and in, in Netanyahu's defence, 
his government is is quite a right wing government. His room for manoeuvre in terms of dealing with um, with uh, with you know a, a, a state for for Gaza or a state for the Palestinians is extremely limited, and his his personal inclination has never been that he would support that. He doesn't believe that uh, the Palestinians can be reliable partners on that front. Uh, others would argue that Israel's own policies make that you know uh, contribute to that that uh, standoff as well. So yes, I mean it's look it's it, it's intractable again there. I mean the stakes are high here. If 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 there was any chance of actually producing some sort of viable Palestinian entity, uh, nations like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, there is talk that they would normalise um, ties with Israel, that the US could then present a, a block in the region um, to sort of counter Iran and its proxies there. Uh, so there's a lot at stake on either side, but um, yes, the, the hopes are not high that, that we're going to see a lot of progress when the war finally ends. Bloomberg's Michael Heath there with the latest on the Middle East. Coming up, China Beige Book International tells us why they think any economic turnaround this year will require more active intervention from Beijing, their outlook later at this hour. But first, we discuss geopolitical risks in Asia and beyond with U.S. Ambassador to Japan, Ram Emanuel. That's next. This is Bloomberg. We have the latest on a new estimate being sent to Congress on Thursday. The U.S. Air Force's new Sentinel Intercontinental Ballistic Missile Program is now estimated to cost at least 37 percent more than the previously projected $96 billion. That will trigger a formal Pentagon review that will include whether to scale back or terminate the project. Right, Japan has signed a deal with the U.S. to purchase up to 400 Tomahawk cruise missiles as it ramps up its military capabilities to counter regional threats. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida's government have pledged to double its annual defense spending to around 10 trillion yen by 2027. Let's cross over to Tokyo, where our chief North Asia correspondent Stephen Engel is with our next guest, Steve. Good morning, Sherry. That's right. Our guest this morning is the ambassador uh, to Japan. Of course, the U.S. ambassador is Ram Emanuel. Thanks so much for joining us here. The first interview in our new studio <laughs> in Tokyo. Thanks so much for inaugurating I feel that. I, I'll tell Michael uh, <laughs> that I feel so privileged. Fantastic. <laughs> we'll be doing a lot more interviews here, obviously. So you were at that signing ceremony yesterday uh, of a deal that I believe was approved in November for the Tomahawk missiles, 400 of them. Uh, obviously, this comes on top of what we heard about the Patriot missiles, the uh, Mitsubishi heavy missiles that are going to be relicensed back to the United States mm -hmm. to restock uh, Patriot missile systems. There's a stealth fighter, uh, you know, uh, being uh, jointly developed or at least plans mm -hmm. going forward with the UK and Italy and Japan. Would you say these various deals indicate that the security threat is as dire as ever for Japan in this part of the world? Well, I mean, they have, there is a security threat. But I do think it's that actually Japan has stepped up in an effective way of showing a credible deterrence, both with the United States on their own, but also with all the group alliances. You obviously talked about the Tomahawk uh, signing the transaction for the counter-strike, which is very uh, bold step forward for Japan. We're going to accelerate the training, so that starts in March, so you have technology and training going in tandem. But in addition to that, one of the things I noted yesterday at the International Press Club, of all the exercises that used to be just U.S.-Japan, they've all gone from two to four plus countries, so they're multinational. They've doubled nearly in size, 4,000 to 8,000, sometimes to 12,000, 20,000. So Japan has, I think, and the United States in partnership, projected a, uh, both an equipment level, training level, preparation level, a credible deterrence to that level. The Tomahawks is a key piece as was the Patriots relicensing uh, for us. You've been here now two years as ambassador. What have right. you seen? What kind of moves have you seen that have impressed you? Uh, and you've tweeted about it, I know, about what Japan has done to its defense capabilities. Well, I think across the board, I mean, there's one of the subjects I talked about yesterday, that the Japan that people had in uh, the stereotype moving at glacial speed. So let's just take a couple things, like not just on the security front, but I would also say on the economic front. First and foremost, uh, 20 years ago, NATO adopted a 2% for GDP of defense. Only 11 of the 31 countries have done that. Mm. Japan's doing it in five years. Right. Made a decision, 
boom. And, the, and yesterday's signing was the first significant down payment exactly towards that. And in their budget, which is lost on people, they didn't spread the Tomahawk purchase over five years. They're doing it all in one year. So it's faster. a get, yeah, much faster. Second, I would also say uh, in this area in the training, on the, uh, in addition to the 2%, uh, they're moving resources from the north to the south. Third, uh, not only on the multi-level training, I, and this gives a wider view of, of deterrence. They, the Camp David Accords that President Biden, or Camp David uh, principles that, Camp, uh, that President Biden brought together South Korea and Japan in a historic uh, meeting and agreement of coordination, not only on defense. Last night, as also, all three universities, one in the States, University of Chicago, Tokyo University, Seoul National University, signed a quantum computing partnership right. in research. So that is reaching deep down. Deterrence is on the diplomatic front. Deterrence is on the military front. And economically, Japan's economy is getting stronger. Which goes into, of course, the Biden uh, export controls on quantum computing. One thing you've also seen down in Kumamoto is TSMC is building a new fab Three. There. Three. Not one, not two. Three facilities there. Micron's doubled their expansion here in Hiroshima area. So there's a big input in the semiconductor space and the capacity of uh, Japan, as I call them, the supply, sh uh, supply chain of the supply chain. In the materials area, in the packaging area, just to name two areas, there is no semiconductor, no chip made that Japan's not a part of. Now, one thing you did tweet as well, you said you wish the U.S. could act as fast as Japan. What did you mean I'm, by that? On the security front, so, I mean, one of the things we're debating, I, I just told you, like, they've gone to 2% to Tomahawk, Counter-Strike, relicensing. We're, one of the things I'm, later on today, we're going to have a ship come, a U.S. Navy ship, as part of the Seventh Fleet, get repaired here in Japan. Yeah. Now, if you have a hot conflict, you're not sending that ship back to San Diego or to uh, Washington State or uh, Hawaii. You have to keep it in theater. Well, we're not prepared. We have the Jones Act. Right. We haven't modernized it. Right. Okay? There's a, we now do the licensing agreement on, um, obviously, the Patriot. There's other type of weapons and equipment we can look at and think about how Japan's industrial base could be part of the arsenal for democracy. And one of the things that we don't do, of, we have laws. The tr one of the things I've been very clear about when it comes to uh, tra uh, basically maintenance. One example, our ships now uh, off of Yemen have been delayed in going back to port in the United States because we are behind in the United States on both the maintenance and the repair of the ship that's supposed to replace it. It is impacting, as a father of a Navy officer, it is impacting the servicemen and women and the security of the United States because we have an antiquated system not ready to deal with the world it is today. So my only comment was, we need to keep, we need to look afresh. Are we doing what we need to do for our security, our deterrence, and to ensure that we are putting our strongest and best foot forward? And I think Japan can be a partner in that effort. TV interviews go by fast, too. We have to get to, <laughs> we have to go to LNG, okay? Oh, I have like 20 other things I, I want to talk about. I know, about. we could talk forever. <laughs> but LNG, obviously, we're hearing that the Biden administration is reviewing uh, stricter criteria, climate criteria for approval of new uh, okay. LNG export facilities. What, what, are, your, what are the Japanese uh, partners? with the export of LNG to Japan potentially. What are they coming to you and saying? Well, look, I mean, one of the things I wrote about last week, uh, the United States is the fourth larger exporter of LNG to Japan. Australia is number one. It's the largest LNG market. Japan, though, uh, has already started out of the 35 nuclear uh, facilities, 12. Seven more, which is what the Prime Minister committed to, or pledged or wanted to do, Seven more of the uh, nuclear facilities that are there in mothballed since Fukushima appropriated staff would eliminate Russia and their ability to do economic coercion in the Japan LNG market. That is both good climate policy and good economic policy for the security standpoint. Second, Japan's the richest area for geothermal. Third, Japan's coastline is ripe for wind offshore energy. There's steps for a country that is historically used to energy vulnerability there's steps being taken that could wean it to a more stable, more secure, and more uh, sustainable energy policy. So LNG, the president's going to make a decision when he does, if he does, how he will do it, the world will know. But it's about the clarity of uh, how to move and have an energy package that is both secure, 
and sus stable and, sus and sustainable. Ambassador, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Next Steve. time we'll do it a little bit longer, okay? Okay, absolutely. Appreciate you coming and inaugurating our Tokyo studio. Okay, Heidi, we're going to send it back to you. Great conversation. Rama Emanuel, the U.S. Ambassador to Japan, speaking to our Steve Engel there. Much more to come here on Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg. Watching Daybreak Asia, the top corporate stories that we're following. JP Morgan has raised CEO Jamie Dimon's pay to $36 million after it reported the highest profit in the history of American banking. His total pay is up 4.3% from 2022 with a $1.5 million salary and the rest coming as performance based incentives. JP Morgan revenue last year was just short of $50 billion. Well, Wall Street bosses at Davos are predicting M&A deals will pick up as the Fed brings rates down. Morgan Stanley CEO Ted Pick says the Fed will be prudent and that predictability is good for investment banking. And Carlyle Group's David Rubenstein sees deals returning as recession fears ease, telling us that he'll be shocked if the Fed does not cut rates by March. Bloomberg has learned that Bobby Jane's company is no longer on track to have the largest ever hedge fund debut. Sources say he's told investors that Jane Capital now plans to launch with five to six billion dollars. That is far below its earlier ambitions of as much as 10 billion. The lowered expectations underscore a challenging fundraising environment for the industry. Some market watchers say Japanese stocks risk becoming a crowded trade as the topics show signs of overheating. Strategists at HSBC and Societe Generale have told Bloomberg that the market has risen too far and investors should start taking profits, but that is a contrarian view. A Bank of America survey this week found 59% of Asia's fund managers are overweight Japan. We'll take a look at the setup as we get into, what, just about half an hour away from the start of trading in Tokyo. We have seen those uh, overbought signals for quite some time, but still it has been such a strong uh, sort of bolt out of the gates, if you will, when it comes to Japan equity so far in 2024. We are seeing broadly an up day as we end out the week. Asian stocks looking to rally into the close as we see. Sydney stocks recovering after five consecutive days of losses. We're seeing upside of one and three tenths of one percent. Watching a lot of the tech names in the Asian session, of course, that was a big rally with the Nasdaq 100 closing at a fresh record high. We're watching Apple suppliers uh, when Korea, Taiwan and Japan come online as well, given that we saw Apple climbing on the back of that analyst upgrade as well as Taiwan Semi's outlook lifting chip makers. So some of those uh, spaces will be watching in today's session in Asia, Sherry. Yeah, the Philadelphia Philadelphia Semiconductor Index seeing its best day in more than a month. And of course, we're watching the Treasury space as well, a little bit mixed with the two year yield slightly down while the 10 year yield was up toward that 4.2%. But it was really that reaction to that resilient data with jobless claims dropping to the lowest level since September of 2022 last week. You can see not a lot of movement when it comes to the US future session, but we're watching also where the dollar is headed because it topped this 200 day moving average earlier in the week, but it ended today's New York session a little bit mixed. Still ahead, we'll flesh out China's growth numbers and its economic outlook with the China Beach Book International. Our interviews next. This is Bloomberg. We're getting breaking news out of Japan. We are getting the inflation numbers for the month of December. Core inflation, excluding fresh food, is growth of 2.3% year-on-year, in line with estimates but easing from the previous month. The year-on-year -year national headline number is coming in at 2.6% for the month of December, slightly above economists' expectations of 2.5%. Now, let's take a look at the core core CPI. Exclude fresh food, exclude energy as well, and it's year-on-year -year growth of 3%. 0.7%, which is in line with expectations and easing from the previous month. Uh, suffice it to say that when it comes to the core number, core core inflation number in Japan, we are seeing uh, that perhaps the Bank of Japan's assessment that upward price pressures would be short-lived are actually uh, coming to fruition. We saw uh, the CPI number weakening in the previous month, is weakening even more in the month of December. And we had seen these expectations given that Tokyo inflation, which is of course a leading 
indicator for the national trend already weakened last month to the slowest pace in over a year. All of this, of course, will be taken into account at next week's BOJ decision, and we'll be waiting for any hints about policy with Governor Kazuo Ueda. Again, the core CPI number for Japan, excluding fresh food, year-on-year -year growth of 2.3%. Daiwa Security says it's ramping up capabilities in Japanese fixed income as it gets ready for a long-awaited shift in monetary policy. The brokerage's deputy president, Keiko Tashiro, told us investors in Japan and overseas are paying more attention to rates as the BOJ gets closer to tightening policy. So I think we've been preparing for a while, not just ourselves, because of higher interest rates. And, and they have, BOJ has changed the policy on yield curves. So um, we've been preparing. We're seeing um, people more interested with interest rates. So um, we w will be allocating resources when we see its curve. Talk to us about the resources you're allocating. How many more? Quantify that for us. Well, I can, I'm not from fixed income, so I can't give you Give us a I sense. Can. So I would think that not just in Japan, but our overseas people, that our investors would be looking, and um, that would be increased resources because it's been you no know, a dormant market for so long. I'm just wondering, the stock market is also doing really, really yeah. well. There's a lot of enthusiasm, mm -hmm. expectations, and so on. Uh, is there a sense that perhaps Daiwa can overtake Nomura at some point? Well, if you look at our share prices, that you just alluded to, the difference in market cap actually is relief shrinking. Um, so we are conscious. I think they are conscious as well. Um, but we are doing quite well. And the big bet, of course, for, for you is uh, China. Mm -hmm. uh, against the odds, and uh, despite the fact that sentiment has been pretty negative, mm -hmm. is it time to reassess your involvement in China, your bet on China, given that the recent data remains weak? Yes. So that is correct. And um, I th we're very cautious. But we also know that there's potential in China, just because of its size and that it's close and all the Japanese businesses that are in China. Um, so we're not, we're, we're ca cautious, but we're not pessimistic about it. What's the red line? I think the red line would be that if, um, if a lot of the liberal, I mean, there were, they've been liberalizing the market for long. So if they stop that and if they redo a lot of the things that they've been doing to open markets for foreign um, uh, banks, that would be when we think that we're not welcome and that's when we would rethink. But we don't see that happening right now. Premier Li Chang spoke to a lot of the corporate chiefs this week mm -hmm. saying, we are open, we are reforming yeah. and you will benefit mm -hmm. from the changes happening yeah. in the country. So I think for capital markets, um, they are at a place that they still have a lot to learn from the U.S., from Japan and Europe. Um, so they've always kept that message. And they've, for us, we opened during COVID. So I think um, just looking at what they've been doing, it, it, has, it hasn't been as close as some other industries. The messaging out of uh, Davos as well has been the global economy is slowing. Mm -hmm. It's sluggish. Mm -hmm. How is that impacting your plans for the next 12, 24 months? So, um, unlike for, for Japan, which is looking at a, a normalization of our economy with interest rates, we and our corporates are doing quite well in terms of um, uh, financial performance. So we're we're not that pessimistic about where we're going right now. Taiwan Security Deputy President Keiko Tashiro speaking to Bloomberg's Hazinda Amin at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Of course, we've been watching China's economy as well. Beijing saying that its economy grew 5.2% last year, but some analysts are questioning the accuracy of Beijing's investment data. Our next guest says any true acceleration of growth will require either a major global upside surprise or more active government policy. Shia is Managing Director of China Beige Book International, and joins us now, Shazad, always great to have you with us. Of course, we have seen really a slew of measures coming, whether it's from the central government with extra bond sales or also from the PBOC allowing more credit out there. How much has been done and how much more can we expect this year? Yeah, there has been a tremendous amount of monetary policy easing over the course of 2023 in China. Um, you know, every sector that we've surveyed is paying far less than they did in years prior. The problem is this is akin to pushing on a string. Companies are simply not interested in going out there and borrowing at the levels they used to because the overall economic growth or the recovery has been so disappointing. You may get continued 
policy easing taking place, but that is not going to be the key to a stronger uh, economic uh, you know, growth year uh, for China. And as far as fiscal is concerned, I think we should prepare for very limited amounts of stimulus taking place there. I think the Premier has made that pretty clear in his comments over the last couple of days. If that's the expectation and that's the way that it plays out, does that mean that we might not see that mon meaningful pickup in growth in China this year as well? I don't think so. As a matter of fact, I think growth this year is going to be lower than what we got in 2023. We have seen, of course, the manufacturing sector still see a little bit of resilience as opposed to perhaps the retail side, the household and business spending. Is that the trend this year as well? Uh, most likely. Manufacturing actually held up far better than anybody anticipated that it would. And we know what's going on. It's things like autos and it's things like green technology and green energy areas which are helping buoy that sector. Um, now, if you get a soft landing out here, that is a very you know, big plus for the Chinese manufacturing sector. Sector. Um, and you are going to need something like that to keep economic growth going uh, because the consumer side, as we saw, uh, a lot of that sentiment has dampened. Consumer spending has come down quite a bit near the end of the year um, and it you know, likely will not recover anytime soon in, in a big way. Does that mean that we should worry about deflationary pressures this year? Well, you know, we are seeing quite a lot of disinflation certainly happening in China. There's outright deflation in places like the property market, where prices have just absolutely cratered over the course of last year. Uh, but yes, there's a continued disinflation story. And that for us sitting out here in the West, that's, of course, a positive. Could we see more coming from the PBOC, especially if you have more advanced economies going the opposite direction? I know there was a lot of pressure on the PBOC, given that other central banks were tightening and you could see those capital outflows. Now that we have other major economies actually starting to cut. Will that give the PBOC a little bit more leeway? And does it matter, given that we started this conversation, with the fact that people don't want to borrow? Look, you know, even if you get some rate cuts, that it certainly gives them room for maneuver. There's no question about it. Uh, but I think they're really struggling with the rate cut idea. You know, you can see things like mortgage rates coming down further. That may help stabilize the property market. That absolutely happened in 2023. Mortgage rates were also down. But unfortunately, as we've seen, sales just continue to fall month after month, quarter after quarter, and prices, of course, as I said, have cratered. Uh, so some of that could help stabilize, that rate cut could help stabilize the property market or is one of the key parts of that, the ingredients, um, if you will. We have heard a lot about this potential balance sheet recession that you could see in China, something that with the likes of what we saw in Japan. Could that be the case if we have more businesses really paying down their own debt, even the government not wanting to leverage up as we have seen them being very careful with, as you say, not really releasing this massive fiscal measures that we've been expecting for the longest time? Yeah, I mean, look, if we continue to see, you know, very, very soft and weak demand, um, that's certainly absolutely a risk, you know, the so-called Japanification as it's uh, discussed, yeah. What can we expect in terms of the commodities outlook? Because we have seen a little bit of a rebound when it comes to steel and aluminum. Yeah. Could that potentially be a more positive uh, picture for 2024? I think so. So again, when we think about industrial activity overall, those were actually the bright spots in some ways. Commodities production, we've seen steel production and copper production, uh, you know, absolutely kind of had record levels over the last year. Um, you could see that continuing, not because of the property and the construction sectors, which were the traditional demand drivers, but because of some of the, uh, you know, other uh, areas of manufacturing, the green technology and so forth that we talked about, and car production that we talked about. So there is a positive scenario for uh, continued improvement on the commodities side if that overall industrial activity holds up on the manufacturing end. We continue to talk about these structural challenges for China, including a shrinking population as well. What are the biggest challenges for the economy in the next 10 years? Look, the population, aging population, a shrinking labor force are absolutely up there. I still believe one of the biggest challenges is the inability of the party to really help the private sector develop and grow. The starvation of SMEs, actually, you know, when it comes to credit, um, has been a big hindrance. And when we talk about the economic transition in China, the healthy growth that the party seeks, that will not happen uh, till you have a fledging, a growing uh, SME sector and a private sector. And that youth unemployment problem, you can massage the numbers all day long. That's not going.
going to go away till those jobs are created and that those are that's where they're going to come from are we getting any new numbers recently with the youth unemployment uh, not being released i think they've decided to go back and revise some of the data and we've got a new figure out um in, in china the investment confidence that you talk about especially in the business sector um how much have you seen in terms of the reversal of the regulatory crackdown? We haven't heard like any big headlines coming out of China. Does that give us a little bit more confidence that perhaps they're going to lay off uh, from those uh, really random uh, restrictions that were applied to different sectors, whether it's tech or education and so many others? You know, I think that the regulatory crackdown, if you will, that's going to continue to evolve and it's going to stay with us. More policy tightening and more regulations are the new norm uh, within China, not less. Uh, they are trying to get better in the sense of floating things so that businesses are not caught by surprise and markets are not shocked. So the methods are evolving in a manner that are more market friendly. But I think, you know, tightening the screws, if you will, is certainly the direction in which things are going to continue to go. Shazak Kazi, good to have you with us. Managing Director of China Beige Book International here with me in the New York studio. We have more to come. This is Bloomberg. Japanese drinks maker Suntory says it's adjusting its product line to cater to a new generation of drinkers who are younger and more health conscious. CEO Takeshi Niyami spoke with Bloomberg about the changes that are being made. Uh, Gen Z, that generation started to show less drinking, which is, I don't like it, but uh, that is evident and that we responded to it by putting more resources to ready to drink. And uh, that market is uh, very much growing. So, and uh, by the way, we are number three in the world. And plus, uh, we have the skill sets to mix alcohol and uh, flavors. Flavors come out of the uh, skill sets of the uh, soft drink industry. And this is yeah. the spirits. We have both. And uh, we've been in this market more than 30 years. We have uh, R&D. So this is the market for us. But so, so Tag, talk to me a little bit. When you say that, of course, they don't drink. I mean, they still want premium drinks. Right. So it's just not alcohol because they're more health conscious. Exactly. So when you look at the ready to drink market, is this alcohol based? Or or is this also a healthier substitute where you feel like you're drinking a cocktail, Both. but it's alcohol free? Both. That has uh, alcohol, but uh, far less. Let's say 3.5% to 4%, whereas 46%. Second, uh, um, sweetener is a natural, but yeah. not sugar. Uh, a little bit sugar. So uh, technology is involved. What, what in trying to understand the perfect mix and again are, are margins actually smaller mm -hmm. compared to what used to do in in you know even very old aged whiskey years ago that's right um, I think I would say uh, at most uh, one one third maybe half uh, comparing to the bottle um, but key thing is uh, people buy six packs in total entire aggregate of uh, profits mm -hmm. is okay so, and I'd like to increase the economy scale eventually. Yeah. Plus, uh, um, uh, we can reduce entire uh, 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 supply chain. That was a Suntory CEO Takashi Niinami there with Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix in Davos. Well, coming up, Japan is preparing for another moon landing mission as they seek to bounce back from a string of space disasters. The details are next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Blackstone CEO Steve Schwartzman says he's optimistic that animal spirits are returning to markets on hopes the Fed will cut interest rates this year. Speaking in Davos, he told us the pace of private equity investments is picking up at the world's biggest alternative asset manager. Well, I think 2024 will be a good year. It'll be start out slower uh, in the sense that, you know, interest rates are still pretty high. and. The Fed will keep them that way. Everybody has their own guess. 
you know, probably till the second half mm -hmm. uh, at some point in there. Uh, so, so that'll that'll sort of have a little bit of um, sort of a baffling effect. Um, stock market had such a run uh, in, in in the fourth <laughs> quarter uh, that that you wouldn't expect that to to really take off and go. And the economy is uh, uh, slowing uh, a bit. Uh, that's normal with high interest rates. So, so the, on the other side of the ledger, the expectation that interest rates are going down is is creating animal spirits again. Uh, and we we did at Blackstone, we did six uh, private equity investments in six weeks at the end of the year after a slow year. And we're much busier now. Yep. Uh, in a way, it represents some type of capitulation for people who are holding back uh, for two years. Uh, so uh, we're, 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 we're optimistic yep. for, for this year. But, uh, Steve, are you, are you worried that if actually we don't get those cuts promised by the Fed, because a lot of the good news is already priced in markets, that people w will start waning on the deals a little bit? So for the moment, you're optimistic. Is second half of the year a little bit trickier? Uh, we will get the cuts okay. uh, because the way we measure uh, inflation, Blackstone, we're already right around the two percent. The fact that the Fed's using different numbers, you know, for rents and real estate, well, we think they're they're sort of looking at six percent inflation in rents and, and residential real estate, and we're the largest owner of residential real estate. We think it's zero to one. Let's bet on us uh, on this one, because we're the people actually doing it. Uh, and if you correct the index for that difference between what's really going on and they're saying it's uh, 6.2, uh, you, you, get, you get around 2%. So I think it's, I'm quite confident that they'll be lowering rates. Blackstone CEO Steve Schwarzman there speaking to Bloomberg's Francine Lacqua in Davos. Take a look at how we're trading. Is. Uh, it does look like we're going to end on a high note when it comes to this trading week here in Asia. Really that uh, tailwind carried through from what we saw on Wall Street, in particular the Nasdaq 100 closing at a fresh record high. Uh, we are looking at some of those Apple suppliers as well as TMC, TSMC to really fuel the tech rally in this part of the world as well. Australian stocks are up by about 1.3%, really snapping those five consecutive days of losses that we've seen. We're also seeing really quite a bit of focus when it comes to these Apple supplier names. Of course, uh, we saw Apple gaining on the back of that analyst upgrade uh, and ship makers will be in focus as we get into the open in Japan as well and uh, South Korea. And Heidi, another story that we're following, a SpaceX rocket was launched earlier carrying the first all-European commercial crew to the International Space Station. The team is expected to dock at the orbiting research laboratory 250 miles above Earth on Friday. The blast-off is a landmark mission for Europe as its space industry struggles to get off the ground due to delays. Now, Japan's space agency is attempting to shake off its own series of recent setbacks in its latest attempt to land a probe on the moon on Saturday. Bloomberg's Nicholas Takahashi joins us now from Tokyo. So, Nicholas, how important is this mission for Japan's national space program? Well, this is a big moment for Japan and all spacefaring nations, I would argue. Uh, for Japan, it's an opportunity to join this coveted club of countries to have successfully reached the moon's surface, which includes so far the U.S., the USSR, China, and most recently India. Uh, in terms of scientific research, JAXA's director has said that this lander, which is supposed to land on the moon's surface in about 13 hours and 20 minutes, 15 hours and 20 minutes, I apologize, um, would greatly reduce the target area for any lunar lander moving forward from multiple kilometers to less than 100 uh, meters. Um, so in every respect, um, not just for Japan, but for, for expeditions to the moon and research there, this will greatly improve efficiency and their ability to conduct comprehensive research on the moon's surface. What else are we expecting for 2024? 
2024 is shaping up to be a big year for Japan's national space program and the private sector as well. Uh, just to rewind a little bit, 2023 uh, was a rough year. Uh, it started in October 2022, actually, when one of its smaller rockets exploded as it was trying to launch. And then in February, when its next generation H3 rocket failed to take off, in March, again, the H3 failed. Um, iSpace, a private company in April, almost reached the lunar surface. Um, it just fell short before the, the company lost contact with the lander. Uh, this Saturday, we're going to see SLIM attempt to launch land on the moon. Later this month, um, we'll see, later next month, I apologize, we'll see uh, the third attempt to launch the H3 rocket. Um, so for JAXA, Japan's National Space Cro Program, this is, this is shaping up to be a pivotal year. Well, thanks, Nicholas Takahashi there in Tokyo. Take a look at some of the stocks that we're watching when trade begins in Korea and Japan shortly. We are, what, just about six minutes away from the start of cash trading. Uh, chip stocks in focus, of course, as I mentioned earlier, TSMC's robust forecast for the industry, creating some optimism that we'll see that broad uh, lift and going into expectations of potentially a stronger improvement and recovery for chip makers more broadly this year. Also watching Daiwa Securities ramping up its capabilities across Japanese fixed income to prepare for the BOJ's long-awaited monetary policy shift and of course going into that BOJ decision next week, Sherry. And Heidi, coming up in the next hour, IG Australia tells us why they see potential for rate cuts sooner than expected for the RBA. Plus, the BOJ edging closer to its first interest rate hike since 2007. For the spotlight at next week's board meeting, we'll get more analysis on that with JP Morgan Securities. We'll have more from the World Economic Forum. Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix hosts the panel on the global economic outlook. We'll hear from Singapore's president, the ECB, IMF, among others. This is Bloomberg. This is Daybreak Asia. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. After the first session of gains in three days for Wall Street, we, of course, were looking at Apple that get an analyst upgrade on the NASA 100, which reached a record high. But Heidi, treasuries were mixed. We had more resilient jobs numbers. Yeah, we're still going back and forth as to, you know, the timing, the, the frequency in terms of expectations of rate cuts from the Fed, right? That's still driving, really, a lot of the sentiment that we, we see across markets. Yeah, and of course, what that really means for other central banks across Asia will be a key question as well as we head towards the BOJ rate decision next week as well. We have the CPI numbers, Heidi, today really showing again that slowdown and perhaps the expectation that the BOJ was right, that input costs rising would really not last that long. So we had inflation cooling for a second month and consumer prices, excluding fresh food, rising 2.3 percent from a year ago. Take a look at the open right now. We're seeing the Nikkei gaining more than a percent after three sessions of losses this week already the Japanese yen not doing much but this of course after we saw significant weakness already this week look at it past that 148 level after falling to the weakest level since November and we've been watching JGBs very closely because they were under pressure after another weak auction of sovereign debt in Japan right now we're seeing it not really doing much at the moment but of course we don't have clear uh, direction when it comes to treasuries either take a look at and what the Cosby is doing right now because we saw gains in the previous session and right now we're seeing upside of more than 1% as well. The Korean won uh, continues to be slightly more positive against the U.S. dollar. It already outperformed all other Asian peers this week given that South Korea's FX authority uh, came out saying that the currency's weakness was somewhat excessive and you can see it right now, uh, the won trading at that 1338 level. For more in Japan CPI, our Japan-Korea Economy and government editor Paul Jackson joins us now from Tokyo. Uh, Paul, great to have you with us. So, what do you make of the CPI numbers? Was the BOJ correct then that these uh, price pressures would fade? Yeah, I think these results today fall largely in line with uh, BAJ uh, expectations and forecasts. And I think they uh, keep us on track uh, for the first rate hike since uh, 2007 in Japan in the first half of this year. But it's not going to be uh, next week. 
Uh, uh, we've had uh, a survey of over 50 economists out, uh, you'll have seen. Uh, not one of them thinks that uh, the BOJ is going to move uh, next week. Uh, we've had a bad start to the year with uh, uh, earthquake that has claimed the lives of more than 200 people. And um, uh, I think uh, this idea that there needs to be some kind of uh, rush to raise rates is, uh, uh, is mistaken. I think they can take their time and, and look at uh, more data before reaching their decision. Uh, so y you might ask, what are they waiting for? Uh, I think we've mentioned this uh, uh, many times before, but it's the uh, wage uh, data from uh, the annual negotiations. Uh, I think that's going to be a, a key metric, among others, uh, just to test, check that we do have uh, a rise in wages that will support a longer-lasting form of inflation that's actually positive for the economy. And remember, Japan has been seeking inflation, uh, uh, unlike other countries, uh, for decades now uh, as a positive way of fueling growth. Yeah, waiting for that virtuous cycle to, to really take hold, right? Um, Paul, so uh, no major changes expected next week, but in terms of the post-decision communication signalling, what are you kind of looking out for? Well, I think there's going to be very intense uh, scrutiny of the comments uh, from Governor Ueda at the uh, press conference uh, after the decision on uh, Tuesday. Um, I think um, his description of are they getting closer to achieving the target will be a, a lot of uh, 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 interest in how he describes that. Usually it's something like we're getting a little closer, a little bit closer. Uh, maybe uh, we'll see something a little firmer uh, uh, in his comments there, and that could be uh, kind of a, one of the big steers that hey, we are getting much closer to that first rate hike in decades. Our Japan, Korea economy and government editor Paul Jackson there. Well, some market watchers say Japanese stocks risk becoming a crowded trade as the topics is and has been uh, for a couple of weeks now showing signs of overheating. That relative strength index that you can see on your screen reaching the highest since May. Strategists at HSBC and Sokgen telling Bloomberg that the market has risen too far. Investors should start taking profits. But our next guest says that he won't be ch chasing Japan's start of the year stock rally but does recommend buying any dips. Tony Sycamore is the market analyst for IG Australia and joins me now here in the Sydney studio. This time is different, has been <clears throat> the prevailing narrative uh, for the Japan bulls. Do you subscribe to that? I do, in many ways. I think the rally in the Nikkei has been built on solid foundation. It's raced out of the blocks in 2024, yeah. up around uh, over 6%. It's not probably great levels to be adding to long Nikkei positions, but we have to think about where the Nikkei can go from here. And you look back to that 1989 high, and we're talking about 38,000, so we're not that far away from that. Do you think that's a first half or a second half story? A second half, I yeah. would hasten to add, yes. Yeah. So I think after this very strong start to the year, it may continue into early February, into the end of the Japanese financial year, potentially, but then I would be expecting to see some corrective price action like we saw at the end of last year. Three to four months of sideways to lower, the Nikkei retracing, and then it pushes up towards that potentially that 38,000 which would be very exciting. You've got to be quite selective anywhere you look right or what are the sort of the broader thematics that you're liking across Asia? Well I still think China's to be treated with caution. I know it rebounded. That's probably yes. the most bullish view that we've had from anyone. <laughs> I, I mean, do you want any exposure to China? Uh, it's something we've steered clear of into the second half of last year. I think the tail risks have receded, but you look at the sequential growth data earlier this week, dropping from 1.5% in quarter three down to 1%. The property market remains in a a, a problematic situation. We did see housing prices drop at the fastest rate since 2015. So the piecemeal stimulus measures just aren't having the desired effect. They have certainly supported the downside risks, but where that upside comes from, that, that sustainable rebound, it's not clear as yet. And I think that's why investors are going to remain cautious. At this point of time, you have to treat bounces like the one we saw yesterday. It may extend for a week or two. But until we see some broader stimulus measures, more effective stimulus measures, you have to treat those rallies, I believe, as short covering rallies. And of course, some of those China proxies you find in the Australian market as well. For Australia, does 
Did the jobs numbers surprise I me? Mean, it felt like we were kind of back to the, the, the good old days of uh, labour market data being so surprising in Australia. Does that change your view of where the RBA goes from here? It does. To me, that was a weak number. You look at the number of jobs lost in December, you look at the hours worked, you look at the participation rate dropping, which is traditionally a sign of workers becoming discouraged. I know there was a holiday element in there as well and a tropical cyclone, but the ABS did note that that tropical cyclone didn't play a part. So it is higher than where the RBA has forecasted now, the unemployment rate, and I expect that will continue higher. And I think where there is some opportunities for investors, particularly in the rate space, is we're just under two rate cuts priced for the RBA here in Australia in 2024. If quarter three, if the inflation data on the 31st of January shows what we've been seeing in the monthly CPI indicator, combined with the weaker jobs data, which we saw, I think we could start to see the rates market move towards three rate cuts in 2024. So to me, the RBA looks underpriced at this point in time. And that's where you would find those opportunities? You prefer looking at the rates market at the moment? I think the rates market drives the equity market. As, as a, We've seen that mm. with US equities this year. I mean, they've been a, a, going back and forth. They've been choppy. And it's been as Fed speakers have been less dovish, as the data's been hotter. But then we see the type of news which we saw overnight, dip buyers coming out, the Taiwan semiconductors, uh, upgrades for Apple. So it's making a very, very tricky start to 2024. And in that respect, I, I was very happy with the way US equities rallied into the back end of last year and, and pushing up to new highs. I think at this point of time, you can potentially be a little bit cautious, a little bit neutral. Stocks aren't running away. And we still need to see how this ebb and flow plays out between rate cut expectations and when that first rate cut comes, because that still is important. Do you want any kind of insurance against your political risk this year? I do, and I, I think probably the obvious place to find that is in crude oil. Um, I, I think crude oil probably is down towards the lower end of a range, which we've seen in the low 70s, and that to me seems to be the, the place to, to, to take that geopolitical insurance, if you like. Gold's an interesting one. I mean, we've seen that fall quite significantly undercut by higher US yields and also a stronger dollar over the first three weeks of uh, 2024. So gold potentially could come back down towards 1950, which I would probably start to look at gold down at that level. But right here, not at this point of time for gold. The dollar's been an interesting one, right? Because even with the, the Fed easing expectations, you're still seeing the risk flows largely go into US dollar. Yeah, I think that's been partly short covering as well, taking some profit on that trade. There was obviously a lot of dollar selling which came about once the Fed confirmed that dovish pivot. But the short covering rally now has also been supported by higher bond yields. But if you look at the price action yesterday in major dollar pairs, the euro sitting on that 200 day moving average, the Aussie's been really well supported down at 65.25 over the past six months and that was low yesterday and it's rebounded this morning so if equities were to continue higher then you've got a nice place to look to lean against for the Aussie dollar at this point of time down below 65.20 you would say that's problematic for the Aussie. Um, we talked about uh, geopolitics you know obviously the Middle East and you know, the, the, the crude play there how closely are you watching the US election? Absolutely. After the Iowa uh, vote this week, we now have, I think, a very interesting run into the US election. And it's going to be interesting in terms of the geopolitical uh, policies, tariffs, uh, all that type of Given thing. Given how big the Trump trade was. It's, yeah, I remember it clearly. And that was a huge <laughs> driver of markets. It really was. You know, if we put see tariffs, if we, you know, I think there's a pretty clear geopolitical risk there as well in terms of, of how things unfold with regards to Europe, with Taiwan, all that type of thing will present risks to markets and, and probably a continuation of the volatility which we've seen in the first three weeks of 2024. It's only been three weeks, huh? It feels like... Seems a lot longer. <laughs> I, I do agree. <laughs> Tony Sycamore, market analyst for RG Australia here in Sydney. Uh, let's take a look at uh, how we're tracking at the moment. Of course, a, a bit of a rebound for the ASX. We have had five straight sessions of uh, losses trading at the lows of about early December at this point for Australian stocks. The SX200 up by just about 1.2%. We're actually off those session highs, but uh, certainly across the board, we're setting up for 
a rally into the end of the week. Uh, this is a picture when it comes to the Aussie dollar, 65.82. So holding uh, a pretty steady, a, a little bit of volatility when it comes to uh, trading in the green back in the overnight session, as we were just talking about uh, perhaps the unexpected or underwhelming reaction that we've seen in oil. Now actually under $74 a barrel when it comes to trading in WTI, but still we have been near the highest close of this year, again on these you know, incrementally uh, ratcheting up of Middle East tensions there. And uh, that headline number hasn't moved very much, but I should probably point out that when it comes to uh, across the futures curve, we have seen a, a, a bit more when it comes to that price action there. Uh, and of course, we've been watching Treasuries, uh, given that the sort of the data that continues to drive the uh, the conversation, the debate over where the Fed will go from there, that sort of surprising robustness when it comes to the initial jobless claims and the other aspects of the labour market data at play as well. Uh, still ahead, JP Morgan Securities Chief Japan Strategist will be joining us and telling us why the political scandal hitting Prime Minister Kishida's cabinet approval ratings is a cause for investor concern. Before that, the latest on uh, the Middle East conflict, Israel vowing to control security in the Gaza Strip after the war, despite calls by the US. We'll get that update next. This is Bloomberg. Watching Daybreak Asia, the top stories we're following this hour. The U.S. Congress has passed a temporary spending bill to avert the partial U.S. government shutdown this weekend. The legislation will be sent to the White House where President Biden plans to sign it. The short-term package is meant to give lawmakers time to complete negotiations on annual funding for the fiscal year that began in October. Israel has vowed to control security in the Gaza Strip for the foreseeable future after its war with Hamas ends. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says this will be a mandatory condition and that he would accept a Gaza civil authority. The U.S. says a lasting peace wouldn't be possible without an eventual state for Palestinians. President Biden says strikes against Iran-backed Houthi militants in Yemen will continue even if they had not halted the group's attacks in the Red Sea. U.S. forces launched a barrage against anti-ship missiles for fifth time since last week. The Houthis, on the other hand, say they are taking concrete steps to improve their military capabilities. Now, the chaos in the Red Sea is starting to disrupt shipments of produce from coffee to fruit. It's also threatening to halt a slowdown in global food inflation. Bloomberg Sue Keenan joins us now with the latest. And Sue, uh, how much could really, uh, how much could this hurt food cargoes? Well, analysts are quick to point out there has been a limited effect so far. They're concerned that when you consider these costly diversions around the tip of Africa for cargoes that may involve produce such as fruit, this involves spoilage and the actual cargo could become unsellable. Again, analysts point out that it's the possibility when you consider how fragile the food supply chain could be that it is of concern to the industry because if disruptions worsen, they could stall the slump in food commodity costs that have just started to make some grocery bills a bit cheaper. That concern, many say, is spooking the shipping industry. We drop into the Bloomberg, you can see shipping rates have soared since attacks by Houthi rebels on the Red Sea cargo ships began late last year. And Bloomberg reporting indicates that grain is now being diverted from the Suez Canal. Also, livestock carriers bound for the Middle East have also had to change course. And again, these are cargoes that can really be impacted by the delays. Now, Italian exporters, which sell about four and a half billion of agricultural produce to Asia, are worried that going around Africa will hurt freshness and add costs for fruits like apples, kiwi, citrus. There's also concerns about any seafood exports. European exports of products like dairy and wine are also of concern. Those in the shipping industry say every now and then they have delays, but they've seen nothing like like this, what's going on in the Red Sea in many decades. So that's really led to more volatility in oil prices, but that upside that we saw in the New York session not being followed through in the Asian session right now. Well, it's certainly holding. Uh, 74 is where we got in the New York session. Uh, that's the highest we've seen so far this year. And again, we've seen a slight dip in Asia trading, but we're holding pretty close 
to where we closed uh, in New York trading. A number of factors uh, offset what is the bearish uh, concern about oversupply in oil right now, and that is what's going on in the Mideast, this increased conflicts, the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, initiating their fifth attack on Yemen-based sites for the Houthis as these attacks in the Red Sea continue. There was also a very bullish oil inventory report. We saw a big decline in oil supplies for the U.S., taking us to the lowest level since October. And so traders are saying oil really searching for a direction here. We've had West Texas intermediate prices range bound since the start of the year, but often swinging widely day to day. We're also seeing those swings in Brent crude prices. Additionally, in the U.S., we have the cold weather factor. Cold weather not only on the East Coast here in New York, um, but heavy snow in the Northwest. And then you get to the Gulf Coast area, which is where the bulk of the refineries are. That's an area of milder weather. Uh, Texas, for instance, getting well below freezing earlier this week. What that's doing is actually cutting about 15 percent of refinery output. And then we've got North Dakota, which lost earlier in the week about half of its output of oil production. Again, weather considered to be temporary, but we are seeing a closely watched gauge called time spreads surge here in New York trading on these short-term issues. We're still keen on there with the latest on the Red Sea food cargoes as well as oil prices. Now, of course, you can get a roundup of all of these stories that we've been talking about on your edition of Daybreak today. Bloomberg subscribers go to DayBeGo, also available on mobile in the Bloomberg Anywhere app. You can customize your settings so you only get the news on the industries and the assets that you care about. This is Bloomberg. Watching Daybreak Asia, shares in Chinese renewables companies jumped in the Thursday session with investors searching for growth drivers amid a broader market slump. Solar supplier Longi Green Energy Technology was among the gainers. Chairman Zhang Baoshen spoke to us in Davos about the sector's longer term outlook. It's hard to assess the exact number, but there will be a certain amount of consolidation in the industry. There are too many homogenous participants nowadays, so in this case, we think only innovative companies that can launch new products could help the industry enter this new booming cycle. It is unrealistic to rely on the existing production capacity and existing products to make the company obtain relatively high profits. And in the consolidation process, only companies with stable and healthy operations with financial supports can push forward consolidation in the industry. I believe these will happen this year to a certain extent. Given expectations of consolidation, would you be interested in acquiring some of these companies? We don't have anything yet. <laughs> we know there are trade barriers in the U.S. and European markets. How is the company navigating that? We have built the 5GW PV module factory in the U.S. with our partner, and we have already displayed the first modules at the exhibition yesterday. So we believe that the layout of these production facilities that we have adopted is fully in line with the current policy requirements of the U.S. government. How prepared are you for a Trump presidency? The elections are this year, and he's doing pretty well. First of all, I think that climate change is the responsibility every citizen of the earth is facing. So even Trump is now running for the U.S. president. I think no matter which party is elected, the trend of developing clean energy in the United States will not change. We still have a firm confidence in developing clean energy in the United States. But Trump was the one who pulled the U.S. out of the Paris Agreement and just wondering how prepared are you for the challenges and the risks under his presidency? During the last Trump presidency, clean energy in the U.S. grew every year. Therefore, we believe that this time, no matter who was elected president, clean energy in the U.S. will still continue to grow. The United States already builds the social public foundation of clean energy, and the American people are willing to contribute to clean energy globally. We firmly believe in this. So for us, we don't have any special arrangements for this. We think that campaigning is one thing and that the country is really developing the clean energy market is another. It's two different matters. 
The chairman of Longyi Green Energy, John Bashan, they're speaking with Haslinda Amman in Davos. Let's take a look at some of the corporate headlines that we're following this hour. And JP Morgan has raised CEO Jamie Dimon's pay to $36 million after it reported the highest profit in the history of American banking. His total pay is up 4.3% from 2022 with a $1.5 million salary and the rest coming in as performance-based incentives. JP Morgan revenue last year was just short of $50 billion. Macy's is laying off about 3.5% of its workforce ahead of the departure of longtime CEO Jeff Jennett. The cuts include about 2,350 employees, mostly in corporate positions. It will also close five stores. Macy's has struggled to compete as consumer preference shifts away from department stores to online retailers. Walmart is giving its store managers a 9% raise in a bid to attract and retain workers. The average wage will now jump to $128,000 and store profits will also play a bigger role in annual bonuses. Retailers have struggled with labor retention as workers increasingly face unruly customers and a rise in store theft. Coca-Cola CEO James Quincy says the company's wide range of products will protect its business if new weight loss drugs cause changes in consumption habits. Speaking to us in Davos, Quincy says that in almost every category, the maker of sodas, juices and sports drinks has products without calories and sugar. When you actually break down the data, um, uh, I don't think it's a big uh, it's a big thing for us. And in the end of the day, if you want to make it super simple, you know we sell a whole range of beverages with from calories to zero calories. And at the end of the day, you can have le you could eat less calories if you want to lose weight. You can't have less liquid. Well, coming up, we we'll get more analysis when it comes to Japan's CPI numbers, what all of this means for markets and the rally going forward. JP Morgan Securities Ri Nishihara joins us next. This is Bloomberg. Deflation is almost over, but there is inertia. So 24 is the year to get rid of inertia and moving toward the economy with the moderate inflation, backing up by the constant increase of wages. Suntory President and CEO Takeshi Ninami with his outlook for the Japanese economy. Take a look at how Japanese assets are trading at the moment. We're seeing the Nikkei seeing a strong upside of 1.5%. This is taking it to the highest level since February of 1990. While we have the likes of tech, communication services and real estate leading the gains. Utilities, one sector that's in the red right now. And we're seeing the Japanese yen at the moment strengthening a little bit. But of course, after a lot of weakness past that 148 level at one point. We're back below that uh, against the U.S. dollar and the 10-year yield holding steady. Of course, we have seen a lot of optimism about the Japanese market. Take a listen. When you talk about five or 10 years and you think about the amount of aggregation and transparency of wealth outside the U.S., particularly in Asia. Uh, I've been going a lot to Japan. I go every quarter. We've doubled down on Japan. It's one example of, a, of the kind of place where we could do extraordinary business. Our next guest is keeping an overweight stance on Japanese equities. Ria Nishihara is chief Japan strategist at JP Morgan Securities and joins us from our Tokyo studio. Ria, always great to have you with us. Of course, I understand why we had such optimism about Japan, especially in 2023 with a weaker Japanese yen. But will this continue even if the BOJ tweaks policy and we see a stronger yen? Uh, thank you, Sherry, uh, for having me. Uh, I think this outpaced uh, rally of Japan equity will likely to have a pause in a short time period. There was a two major reasons of the rally of Japan equities year to date. One is a uh, uh, you know a tailwind from global macro environment, the uh, yen def depreciation, and uh, more solid U.S. demand for Japan exporters, and higher yields benefited value stock as well. And second is higher expectations 
expectation for structural change in Japan, including ending differentials, more corporate action in response to Tokyo Stock Exchange initiatives, and more inflow from individual investors. So the more likely that uh, U.S. economic soft landing scenario will be, the more evidence we see that in uh, Japan structural changes and more inflow from Japanese individual investors, the more likely the uh, you know rally of Japan stocks to to sustain. What sectors do you like? Yes, yesterday we saw uh, exporters did well, value stocks at large did well, semi also did did well, uh, thanks to that U.S. high tech's uh, good performance. And going forward, I believe value stocks uh, will continue to outperform because uh, because of this TSE's corporate governance theme, especially uh, by mid-year uh, when uh, the corporates will uh, announce that full year results and in June, it is a season of the annual shareholders meeting. Up until then, I believe many Japan corporate management will think about new initiatives to improve their ROE uh, in, in TSC's initiatives. What are you expecting for the domestic consumption sector? Because we are seeing, of course, inflationary pressures at a time when wages perhaps are not keeping up. So real wages remain still under pressure. Yes, actually, uh, consumption basket, consumption sector stocks are our core, uh, main cause uh, throughout 2024. We call it uh, the timing of this idea uh, will fall on in the first half of this year. So not yet, if we look at that consumption data, real wage data, that uh, latest print shows that 3% uh, you know, down uh, real wages. So we are, the Japanese, Japanese economy is is still in a transitional period from deflation to inflation. So that a higher wage uh, hike um, in Shunto spring wage negotiations in March, we see more sign, uh, I mean, between the Christmas time to New Year's, more corporate management express their view, a higher wage hike in 2024. So that's one thing. And another thing is see wage print, uh, probably if it's early, uh, February print or after uh, would support that um, you know consumer sentiment and as a result consumption. So we we need to wait another couple of months. How is corporate sentiment unfolding in Japan right now? We usually follow the large manufacturers with the Tankan survey, but what about the smaller companies there? Yes, actually, the uh, largest uh, change in December, Tankan, which was announced in mid-December, is a good, you know, business sentiment pickup is not only within large corporate, but it prevailed to the SME as well. So that uh, good uh, corporate sentiment is now prevailing throughout the Japanese corporate regardless of size. You mentioned earlier as well that we have seen more interest from individual investors when it comes to really getting into the markets. And we've also seen the government trying to encourage this sort of investments as well. Are we going to be see more participation by retail investors in Japan? And what does that mean for where the markets go from here? Yes, uh, this would be a very large catalyst for Japan equities uh, or other assets uh, across the world. Because consider that Japan uh, individual hold 2,000 trillion yen wealth, and more than half of it, uh, you know, hold by cash, a uh, bank deposit, which gets zero percent. So, uh, government started a new initiative called Japan New NISA, uh, Japanese ISA tax bracket for individual investors' investments. Um, so that could be a trigger point uh, in addition to the uh, rate increase we've seen uh, in the past uh, half years. Um, I mean, depending on this, if individuals uh, shift uh, their uh, cash in their bank account to, uh, let's say, 10% of their uh, bank account shift, uh, that could bring like 10 trillion yen in flow in Japan equities. It's not only a Japan equities st I mean, story, but uh, related to cross assets in across the world. Hmm. Be 
potentials. Uh, yeah, and the Japanese public also has been um, pretty disappointed, though, on the performance of the government, right? I mean, the cabinet's approval rating plunging to new lows. And we have seen a lot of uncertainty with that uh, funding scandal really uh, deepening in the government. Is that just political noise, or will it have implications for confidence in Japan and its assets? Yes, uh, there was a concern, especially toward the year end last year. And we see the sign of the government's approval ratio is now bottoming out. Uh, to see the uh, survey by Kyodo, uh, it shows that five point improvement in January. So we need to see the other major survey this month. But government address uh, for the earthquake uh, probably helps the approval ratio of uh, cabinets. And also, if we see higher wage hike in February in March as a result uh, as a outlook uh, as a result of the uh, spring wage negotiation that would be a you know strong supporting factor for the cabinet Ria Nishihara chief Japan strategist at JP Morgan Securities great to have you with us Heidi uh, we're listening to those comments on that bullish outlook for the Japanese market with the Nikkei already at that 1990 high today so much of this, of course, comes down to what Central Banks does. We're watching ahead of the BOJ next week. Of course, no change expected, but the communication will be scrutinized. And the governor of India, Central Bank Sherry, says rate cuts are not yet on the horizon for that economy. No firm evidence that inflation has yet settled. Speaking to us at Davos, Shaktakanda Das also added to the chorus of policymakers warning that investors are getting ahead of themselves with bets on monetary easing. Financial markets all over the world have uh, started talking about rate cuts, whereas the central banks are nowhere near it. As per their uh, stated, you know, as per the statements which are coming out from various central banks. So far as India is concerned, inflation has moderated from the peak of 7.8 percent, which we saw immediately after the onset of the Ukraine war. Inflation has steadily moderated. It has come within our target range of 2 to 6 percent. But our target being 4 percent, we are still, you know, moving towards 4 percent. So we have to reach 4 percent. Till we reach 4 percent on a kind of a sustainable or a durable basis, I think it will be too premature to talk about uh, rate cuts. But in expectations the context of are India. that you get to 4 percent before 2025, which means you'll get there this year. Could we see possibly rate cuts in the second half? You see, I have said uh, yesterday in another forum that uh, next year our expectation of average inflation, average the for the whole year, starting 1st April 24-25, the average uh, headline inflation is expected to be, is likely to be 4.5%, with several ups and downs. And unless we see a clear, you know, a clear evidence of, or a clear sort of, unless we reach 4%, and unless we see clear evidence that it is going to sustain at that level, it will be really premature to talk about uh, rate cuts and at the moment as I speak to you, the topic of rate cuts, the topic, you know, that aspect is not on our table. It's not even under discussion. Mm -hmm. Our focus is now to remain actively disinflationary, to bring the inflation to 4%. RBA Governor Shakti Khandadar says speaking with Bloomberg's Haslin to Armin there in Davos. We'll have more conversations from the World Economic Forum. Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix hosting the panel on the global economic outlook. We'll be hearing from Singapore's president, the ECB, the IMF, as well as Germany's finance minister, Carlyle founder David Rubenstein, and Saudi Arabia's finance minister. This is Bloomberg. MSCI Asia at the moment gaining seven tenths of one percent, being led higher by tech companies. Of course, not surprising given that we had the positive outlook from TSMC that led to chip makers gaining ground in the New York session, and the Nasdaq 100 finishing at a record high, with Apple also getting an analyst upgrade, Heidi. 
Sure, as we continue to track the latest when it comes to China's economic slowdown, Chinese travelers were once the biggest spenders on overseas trips, but they've been staying close to home even a year after the scrapping of stringent COVID curbs, and that pullback has come at a massive cost to the global tourism industry. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Asia Transport reporter, Danny Lee. So, uh, Danny, what have you seen in your research and investigations in terms of the impact of this pullback of the once you know, big spending Chinese tourist. Yeah, we've been able to crunch the numbers and, and as you said, you know, Chinese tourists were the biggest spenders on overseas travel. Right now, where we stand, 60% of flights, uh, of we're at about 60% of, of pre-COVID levels in terms of outbound travel, in terms of international flights. And what does that amount to? So back in 2019, we saw 170 odd million flights uh, uh, be flown, trips be flown by, by Chinese tourists. That amounts to 200 148 billion dollars that accounts for 14 percent of all global foreign travel spending and now what we have seen is a bit of a wipeout here you know down to 129 billion that has been lost in terms of all that uh, Chinese travel spend that has now not taken place because of the the huge uh, removal of international flights uh, uh, connecting China with the rest of the world and so it, when you compare that to the likes of the UK the US Germany and France which has all seen the the international uh, travel spend recover, there's a huge gulf between where China was and where it is now. And you, know, you could fully expect things to recover in time, but that big gap has a huge impact when it comes to uh, countries who are so dependent on, on Chinese travel and Chinese tourism. Which areas were the worst affected and why? Yeah, we've seen the likes of Taiwan, for example. Uh, that's very much been politically driven, uh, but also the impact from COVID when flights were pretty much severed. One of the really fascinating ones that really interested me was India. India and China, two of the world's biggest and fastest growing air travel markets, have absolutely no non-stop connect uh, flights between them. So that between the two uh, has got no connections left. Then you see the likes of the US and, and Canada where flights are very much down between themselves and China. Uh, but one of the really interesting pieces that we found in our research was the Middle East. The Middle East has seen its connections with China uh, recover to basically pre-COVID levels, and there is the potential for that to, to grow even further. And that's really driven by its, uh, its, 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 its friendliness with China over the years and across what China sees as a strategically important part of, uh, of, of one of its policy makings, the Belt and Road Initiative. And so you know, any uh, country that has benefited Benefited from Chinese investment uh, and, and Chinese policy making along this Belt and Road, you know, is seeing a bigger increase and a bigger uptick in flights because ultimately it is easier for them to restart flights with China. All right, Bloomberg's Asia Transport reporter Danny Lee, and of course you can get more on that piece on the Bloomberg terminal. And despite the pessimism over China travel, one of the country's biggest names in tourism now saying that the sluggish economy and slumping markets are not deterring consumers from getting back to traveling. We spoke at Davos with Trip.com Group CEO Jane Sun about the trends she is seeing in the domestic and international markets. For our business, it's doing very well. Uh, we have four segments. The first one is domestic travel. Uh, not only we recover fully to 2019, we far exceeded 2019 by more than 50%. The second, second part is out, uh, outbound travel, which is to bring Chinese travelers from China to the rest of the world. So we look at both demand side on our search as well as the supply side. The demand side already exceeded 2019 level. However, on the supply side, we still have two major hurdles. The first one is the visa application still takes too long, particularly to Europe and to the United States. Uh, the second hurdle is the flight capacity and shortage of the labor. I'm very hopeful in 2024 we'll do better in that segment. I'm curious, though, whether Chinese consumers want to travel mm. to Europe and the U.S. in the same kind of numbers we saw in 2019 
or has something mm. shifted mm. as some of the uh, international relations have frayed? Mm. Not really. Uh, Chinese people are taught for 2,000 years to travel by Confucius. His teaching is it is better to travel 2,000 miles than to read 10,000 books. So parents always want to use travel as a means to educate their children. When you are uh, traveling, you are not only learning theories, you are working with the people along the way. So Chinese people enjoy traveling. Well, I'm just curious to see how this pairs with some of what we see in the economic data and some of what we're seeing out of even official rhetoric that just demand is not there. You look at loan demand falling off a cliff regardless of rates that have been falling pretty significantly. You talk about the potential for some sort of further stimulus. Where's the disconnect in all of the demand that you're seeing on your site and what we're hearing about from all of the other uh, indicators? Yeah, because China is very big, uh, we need to look at different segments. Certain segments have pressure. For example, real estate might have some pressure. However, if people are not buying houses, uh, their disposable income is increasing. So the segments that's doing very well, travel is doing very well, entertainment is doing very well. For example, concerts, uh, music festivals, opera, uh, these are doing very well. Wellness products are doing very well. Trip.com Group CEO Jane Swin there with Bloomberg's Lisa Abramowitz in Davos. You can catch us live and catch up on some of those past interviews, those conversations from Davos and our interactive TV function that's at TV Go. You can also dive into any of the securities or the Bloomberg functions we talk about, plus become part of the conversation by sending us instant messages during our shows. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Do check it out. It's at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Global passive funds are putting added strain on the world's worst performing stock market. As they join peers in selling off Chinese and Hong Kong equities, Bloomberg's Charlotte Yang has more from Hong Kong. Charlotte, so this is really amplifying the downside. Yeah, so this is definitely, you know, adding to um, the selling pressure we've seen. So the latest from the Morgan Stanley team, we learned that managers of those um, benchmark tracking uh, funds have so have not sold um, 300 million uh, worth dollars worth of shares in mainland in Hong Kong just this month, and that marks like a reversal. You know, from not, they were the net buyers in the late uh, last half that last year. So that's definitely adding to um, the the re, uh, short term selling pressure, and the market knows about that. And you know. From our um, chat with you know, traders, the sell we've seen yesterday and also this week, some of that is also triggered, you know, by the um, the risk management of stru some structured products. Because if the benchmark continues falling like this, that certainly you know is going to um, trigger more uh, more managers do uh, risk management, and that definitely adds to uh, more selling pressure as well, and also her sentiment. Is the national team coming in? Uh, oh, the net, yes. So uh, for the for the on, for the onshore, uh, you know, we some, a few, you know, the closely watched um, ETFs such as Huatai Pine Bridge, we've seen a a, a, very, a stellar um, spike in the turnover yesterday, and that and a few of that, you know, and also that coincides with when we saw uh, how the CSI 300 erased loss of as much as 1.8 percent, and then to gain 1.4 percent, that has raised suspicion that you know we're seeing more um, the state funds are behind this, which is all no, more common. common Commonly known as the national team, we've seen that in previous sessions, and um, so when the national team comes in to rescue the market to help stabilizing the losses, uh, but that is usually more short short term, um, a, more of a short term effect, more than anything that's um, effect meaningful enough to turn around for the fundamentals in terms of sentiment. Yeah, it's hard to see uh, very much having a, a, a you know the impact of longevity when it comes to sentiment for China equities at the moment. Our Asia equities reporter Charlotte Yang there with the latest. Take a look at some of the stocks that we are watching once the markets open in Hong Kong and across mainland China. Uh, TSMC and its peers will be in focus on the chip making giant's robust forecast for the industry. We'll be watching some of the other chip related stocks in those markets as well. Also watching uh, oil producers. Tensions remaining high and the the Red Sea, we're starting to see really across the futures curve uh, pricing start to ratchet up a bit as well. 
Well, Daybreak Australia will be back next week with a new 7 a.m. Hong Kong time slot. You can tune in at 6 a.m. Tuesday to Saturday to watch Balance of Power live from Washington, really breaking down the biggest political news headlines in what we know is a pivotal election year with a countdown to November's presidential elections. Monday's 6 a.m. slot will feature the best of Bloomberg's long-form programming. And of course, Heidi, you know that I'll be on special assignments after today's show. So uh, you'll have fun anchoring with Annabelle Droolers in the meantime. But I'll be back with you in the second quarter, of course, with more exciting developments and the reunion of, of course, Shidi, the dynamic duo. <laughs> <laughs> Cannot wait for that. <laughs> That's it from Daybreak Asia for today. Our markets coverage continues as we look ahead to the start of trade in Hong Kong, Shanghai and Shenzhen. Stand by for Bloomberg Markets, China Open. This is Bloomberg.